Good morning and welcome to today's webcast, the Tax Reform Overview. Before we begin, I'm going to play a brief housekeeping video. Welcome and thanks for joining us. We're pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts to help companies and individuals conquer challenges as they plan for what's next. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize how you both view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons, each relating to a different aspect of our session. You can download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget to the right of the slide view. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by typing a question in the Q&A window below the slide view and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session will offer you one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the requirements as specified by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of the polling questions, which we'll ask throughout today's presentation. To respond to a poll, click the button next to your answer. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE progress widget to open a PDF file that you can save to your computer. Don't worry if you can't download your PDF certificate today, we'll email a copy to you in two weeks. If you're attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our attendance sheet to receive CPE credit. The attendance sheet is available in the slide deck and handouts widget. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. Also note that CPE credit can be awarded only to participants registered as themselves and isn't available to participants who view the on-demand version. As a reminder, the presentation you're about to see isn't legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. I'm happy to introduce today's presenters, Scott Peterson, Tax Senior Manager, Jennifer Schmidt, National Tax Director, Accounting Methods and Periods, Roy Deaver, National Tax Partner, International, Andy Cates, National Tax Partner, ASC Topic 740, and Gunnar Haugen, Tax Senior Manager. Jennifer, I will now turn the line over to you to get us started. Great. Thank you, Emily. So, uh, just to say from the beginning, we have a packed agenda today. Um, first, we're going to briefly recap how we got here, and then, and then Scott and I will shift to cover the key changes affecting individual and business taxpayers. Roy will then cover the key international changes, and Andy will talk about how the changes impact 2017 financial reporting. And then Gunnar will briefly talk about some of the changes affecting pass-through businesses and how they might impact entity choice. So as you know, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is now law. It was first introduced in the House in early November, and the Senate introduced its own version shortly thereafter. Both chambers passed their respective bills, necessitating a reconciliation in conference. An agreement was reached, and both chambers passed the reconciled bill on December 20th, clearing it for the President's signature on December 22nd. So with that, I'll turn it over to Scott to briefly talk about the key changes for individual taxpayers. Thanks, Jennifer. Ultimately, how the tax bill impacts each individual or family depends on which state you live in, household income and wealth level, family size, whether you own a home, among a variety of other facts and circumstances. The tax bill, effective 1-1-2018, maintains seven tax brackets, but generally lowers rates across the board. The top rate falls to 37% from 39.6%. With that being said, the new restrictions on deductions may cause many taxpayers to be in a higher effective tax rate than they previously were. These next two slides will show the income brackets and tax rates compared 2018 to 2017 for married filing joint and, married, and uh, single filers.
The standard deduction under the new bill is doubled and the personal exemptions are suspended. The standard deduction going forward is $12,000 for single filers and $24,000 for married filing joint filers. The personal exemption was $4,050 per family member, which has now been suspended. The AMT exemption is increased along with the associated phase-outs such that less taxpayers should be in AMT. The amount you can subtract from your AMT income rises to a little over $109,000 for married filing jointly and a little over $70,000 for single filers. The income level above which the exemption gets reduced has increased to a million dollars for married filing joint filers and $500,000 for single filers. <clears throat> this is probably the most notable change in the new tax bill. Uh, state and local taxes along with property taxes are now going to be capped at $10,000. This applies to state income taxes, local taxes, and property taxes such as taxes on your house, land, jets, and autos. There, there was one favorable change uh, to cash contributions. It used to be a uh, limit to 50% of your adjusted gross income. Uh, they, had, they bumped that up 10% to 60% uh, of your adjusted gross income. No change to uh, the written acknowledgments. For gifts, if it's over $250, you have to have a written acknowledgment from the, from the charitable donation. And one important uh, note is there's no change to uh, the donations of highly appreciated securities into donor advised funds. Mortgage interest on loans taken out on or after December 15, 2017 for principal or secondary residents are capped to $750,000 of loan balance. The deduction for new home equity loans have also been suspended. One thing to note is that any previous mortgages have been grandfathered in at the $1 million loan balance amount. Suspended 2% miscellaneous itemized deductions. Uh, these have also been suspended. So any investment management fees, tax credit fees, unreimbursed employee expenses, um, there's no longer a deduction uh, available. In, you know, under the previous rules, there was a deduction, but it really depended if you were an alternative minimum tax or not, if you really received a benefit. For divorce or separation agreements executed after December 31st, 2018, alimony payments are not deductible by the payor and not includable by the payee. Under the previous rules, the payor would receive an adjustment to income for any alimony paid, which reduces income dollar for dollar, and the payee would report any alimony received as income. So what essentially this is doing is now there's no movement of income from a high tax bracket ex-spouse to a lower tax bracket ex-spouse. The gain on your principal home. So in the proposed uh, bills, they actually had uh, that you would have to live in your principal residence for five years in order to get the gain exclusion. That did not make uh, make it through the final the final bill. So it was still is unchanged if you live in your home two out of uh, the five years as a principal resident, you're able to exclude uh, $500,000 of the gain um, if you're married, filing joint, and $250,000 if you're a single filer. Uh, the estate and uh, gift tax lifetime exemption is doubled to approximately $11 million per person. The increased estate tax exemption will likely prompt estate plan revisions. It is more important now than ever to review existing estate plans to make sure they account for higher exemptions as some old formulas previously used can disinherit family members. There's portability planning that needs to be identified and stepped up in basis opportunities. Section 529 college savings plans can now be used for elementary school or secondary public, private, or religious school. Please note that this is limited to $10,000 per year. Under the previous rules, the 529 college savings plans could only be used for
for uh, college tuition and related, ed uh, related education uh, expenses for college. There are new statutory withholding rates, 22% and 37% uh, for supplemental income. Supplemental income is option income, RSUs, and bonuses. This is now to conform with new income tax rates. Once your supplemental income reaches $1 million or more, the withholding rate for federal is 37%. Anything under that would be the 22%. A few noteworthy changes. Uh, there's been no change to uh, qualified small business stock treatment. This allows uh, taxpayers to exclude up to $10 million of gain if it's a qualified small business. So it's, it's great that that still is in the, in, in the rules going forward. Um, there was something in the proposed regs that you would have to uh, do stock sales based on LIFO or on FIFO, first in, first out. Uh, but there's no change there, so now you can still specifically ID any stock, uh, stock that you're selling. Uh, for state conformity, it's still a gray area. We don't know if California, Washington, New York, uh, how they're going to conform to the new bill. So more on that once we get it. For cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, there, hasn't, there wasn't a, uh, a ton in the new bill on this. So still, it's treated as property. Then once you sell uh, any cryptocurrency, it's going to be a capital gain. Whether you know it's a short-term or long-term capital gain is, is based on your holding period. So if you hold for over 366 days, uh, you have a long-term capital asset. Long-term capital gain rates and dividend rates, there's no change to that, so it's still the preferential rates. Some individual tax planning ideas. There's always going to be, uh, you know, the timing of the sale of your of, of your stock, whether you're towards the end of the year and you need to do capital loss harvesting. Um, there's AMT planning, trying to find the uh, AMT crossover point. So this would come into a, to to play with any incentive stock option exercise and holds. And then there's always going to be the estate and gift uh, tax planning, since the uh, the exemption has, has been doubled. Jennifer? Thanks, Scott. So now we'll shift gears and kind of talk about some of the changes affecting uh, business taxpayers. The first and probably one you're familiar with because it receives so much press in the, in the tax law is the new tax rate for corporations. The corporate tax rate is going to drop to a flat 21% rate from the current graduated rates that top out at about 35%. Now, importantly, fiscal year taxpayers will need to use a blended rate for the year that includes January 1st, 2018, which is based on the number of days before January 1st where the old rates would apply and the number of days after January 1st where the 21% rate would apply. Other significant changes affecting corporations, the corporate AMT is repealed after 2017, and the dividends received deduction is generally reduced uh, in light of the new 21% rate. Going forward, the NOL deduction is also modified, specifically for NOLs generated in tax years beginning after 12-31-2017. The utilization of such NOLs will be limited to 80% of taxable income in the year they are used. In addition, for years ending after 2017, NOLs will no longer be eligible for the two-year carryback, but instead will be carried forward indefinitely. Now, one item to note here is that these two provisions have slightly different effective dates. Uh, now, this is primarily an issue for fiscal year taxpayers who may be on track to generate an NOL for their year that ends in 2018, because such NOL would not be eligible for the carryback under the new rules, um, but it would not be subject to the 80% limitation when ultimately used. Uh, this appears to be an issue where the conference agreement and the goals that were outlined in there and what actually made it to statute differ uh, because the conference agreement originally had both provisions becoming effective for NOLs generated in tax years beginning after 2017. You know, it's possible we could see a change 
uh, to align these effective dates through a technical correction somewhere down the line. Uh, but until that time, uh, the effective date, as noted on the slide, is, is the rule we need to follow. Another big change is that going forward, a limitation is placed on a business's ability to deduct interest expense. Now, for most taxpayers, the deduction will be limited to roughly 30% of what is called adjusted taxable income, which is taxable income computed without re regard to non-business items, uh, business interest, uh, the NOL deduction, uh, the pass-through deduction, which Gunnar will talk about a little later, and then for years beginning before 2022, uh, deductions for depreciation, amortization, and depletion. Uh, any amount that is limited uh, is carried forward indefinitely, and businesses with average gross receipts of less than $25 million or uh, an electing real property trade or business would be exempt from this provision. The new law does greatly expand the availability of several simplified accounting methods for taxpayers with average gross receipts of less than $25 million. Specifically, such taxpayers would be permitted to use the cash method as their overall method of accounting and would be exempt from the requirement to maintain inventories, uh, generally permitted to either follow their book method or to treat these inventory items as non-incidental materials and supplies. They would also be exempt from the uniform capitalization rules and the requirement to, to use the percentage of completion method for any long-term contracts which are expected to be completed within two years. Another change in the accounting method space is a new provision that was added related to the recognition of income for an accrual basis taxpayer. Um, this new backstop was added sp specifically for accrual basis taxpayers that have uh, what is called an applicable financial statement or an AFS. Such taxpayers would be required to include an item in taxable income no later than when such item is recognized in the company's applicable financial statement. So this change will be significant for some companies, uh, particularly in light of their adoption of ASC 606. Uh, the new FASB revenue recognition standard. Uh, for some companies, the new standard is expected to accelerate revenue recognition when compared to the rules under current GAAP. And with this new provision, companies may now be required to recognize the revenue for tax purposes earlier than they would have otherwise been required absent this new provision. So a change you're probably more familiar with is the increased expensing under the bonus depreciation rules. This change is retroactive to qualified property placed in service after September 27, 2017, so it will affect 2017 tax returns. Uh, the bonus percentage not only increases from 50% to 100%, uh, but the property eligible for bonus depreciation is also expanded to include used property that's acquired in an arm's length transaction and property in film, television, and live theatrical productions. The bonus percentage will phase down, though, starting in 2023 and be completely phased out by 2027. Another change in the depreciation space that's important to note is the changes for improvement property particularly in light of an error the drafters had in transferring the proposal in the conference agreement to the statute. In short, what the conference agreement's goal was was to condense the various classifications for improvement property, of which there was qualified leasehold improvement, qualified restaurant property, and qualified retail improvement property, to just one category, which was a new category introduced in 2016, qualified improvement property, or QIP. Going forward, QIP is the only improvement pro L or classification for improvement property that is retained. Now, the QIP recovery period uh, has had a 39-year recovery period where the others had 15, and the goal was to drop the 39-year recovery period to 15 years, and the property was to remain eligible for bonus depreciation. However, the statute as written does not reflect this goal, and what we're left with is 39-year recovery period and no bonus depreciation for any improvement property going forward. 
Now, it's, this is one item that's received a lot of attention, and it's very possible we will get a technical correction because it very much goes against uh, what was in the conference agreement. But again, we'll have to wait and see um, when that can be uh, passed by Congress. So one last item staying in the depreciation space is the 179 deduction was almost doubled with a corresponding increase in the phase-out threshold. Eligible property also now includes QIP and certain, re, uh, certain real property improvements. And so this expansion may partially offset the error that I just mentioned related to QIP for taxpayers who are able to use uh, the 179 deduction. There are also several changes made to the treatment of certain fringe benefits and entertainment expenses. In short, uh, these changes largely limit the deduction for such items for companies or eliminate the exclusion from wages for employees. Uh, specifically, entertainment expenses are now disallowed even when they're directly connected to a business activity, and only a 50% deduction is permitted for certain de minimis meals. And moving expense reimbursements will generally need to be included in an employee's wages through 2025. more changes in this space. Uh, the deduction for transportation benefits is repealed, uh, though the exclusion from employee wages was retained. Um, however, the wage, re the wage exclusion for bicycle commuting is suspended, however, through 2025. And the bill prohibits the exclusion from wages of achievement awards given to employees in the form of cash, gift cards, sporting event tickets, and other similar items. Uh, this change was really just a clarification of what was considered tangible personal property under the existing rules. So with that, we have our, for our poll question. Which rule change do you think will have the greatest impact on your business? Uh, the reduced corporate tax rate to 21%, the increased expensing of qualified property, uh, essentially the expanded bonus depreciation and the increased 179 deduction, the expansion of simplified accounting methods for taxpayers with gross receipts of less than $25 million, the new limitations on entertainment expenses and fringe benefits, or not sure, not applicable. And I'll give you a moment to respond. Be sure to select your answer and hit the submit button. Okay, with that, let's see the results. Uh, so it looks like for most taxpayers, it does appear to be the uh, reduced corporate tax rate with several uh, not sure or not applicable at this time. Okay. So uh, just a few things that, you know, we discussed obviously a whole bunch of different changes, and I just want to briefly review a few items that may warrant your attention in the, in the short term. Uh, so first, with the coming uh, 2018 tax reduction that we just talked about for, for corporations, um, companies have a one-time opportunity to create a permanent tax savings through a change in accounting method for a timing item. So this allows us to take a timing item and create a permanent benefit. But to create this permanent benefit, uh, the company would need to implement an accounting method change to accelerate deductions or defer income before the tax rate drops. In other words, to make this change on your 2017 tax return. Now, for many income and expense items, there's often more than one permissible method of accounting, and the IRS allows several different accounting method changes to be made at the same time the tax return is filed. Therefore, there's still time to evaluate your current accounting methods to identify other permissible methods that can create permanent tax savings for your business, but only if you act before the 2017 return is due, including, and that includes the extended deadline. Uh, common method changes include changes for depreciation, including changes following a cost segregation study, and changes for various accrued liabilities, prepaid expenses, and deferred revenue. Additionally, in light of the fringe benefit changes, companies should evaluate their reimbursement policies and accountable plans to determine if any changes should be made. And with that, I'll turn it over to Roy to discuss the changes affecting multinational businesses. Thanks, Jennifer. So right now I'm going to give you a high-level overview of the uh, international changes 
We are having a more robust international tax discussion on a, a webcast that will take place next week on the 16th. Um, we did talk about that a lot of the changes in the bill are taking effect on 1118. However, some of the international changes will have an impact on 2017 tax returns. Under the old law, the U.S. generally operated on a worldwide tax system such that the U.S. tax all the income of a U.S. company. However, earnings from foreign subsidiaries were generally deferred from tax until those earnings were repatriated back to the U.S. When that happened, the U.S. shareholder would recognize dividend income, and if the shareholder were a C corporation, then they would get a credit for any underlying taxes paid by that foreign subsidiary to mitigate the double tax burden. And then you had the subpart F regime on top of that, which was a backstop to, to this general deferral concept to counteract any perceived abuses within the system. Under the new law, uh, U.S. companies generally still are going to be subject to a worldwide tax system, but there are some changes that are going to reduce the tax on certain foreign earnings. However, these benefits are largely available only to C-corporations, namely the, the exemption system for dividends from foreign subsidiaries and the new uh, foreign-derived uh, and tangible income provisions, which we'll address in more detail in a little bit. Uh, the subpart F system generally was retained, and in fact, it was expanded a bit to add in some new category, a new category of subpart F that companies may be subject to. And then in order to move into this new system, there's a one-time toll charge, which will take uh, effect, again, on 2017 tax returns. So on the taxation of foreign income, again, there's a, an exemption of foreign dividends received, but this exemption is only available for a C corporation that owns stock of at least 10% in a foreign corporation. And there's a one-year holding period required for that exemption to apply. Now, that holding period doesn't need to be met on the date that the dividend is paid, but overall, the stock has to be held for a year in total. And the final qualification is that the dividend cannot be a hybrid dividend, which is there must not be a deduction or tax benefit in the foreign country available uh, or as a result of that dividend being paid. Now, there is some new provisions with respect to the taxation of income from intangible property, and they act somewhat in concert with each other and are ca calculated in a similar manner. However, the benefits of these generally are available only to C-corporations. So the Global Intangible Low Tax Income, or GILTI as it's referred to, is a new category of subpart F that imposes a U.S. tax on foreign earnings that are, one, not attributable to tangible depreciable assets, and two, are subject to a low rate of tax in a foreign country. So as I mentioned, S-corporations, LLCs, and individuals may have a higher tax burden than C corporations as a result of these provisions, as C corporations are uh, allowed, one, both foreign tax credits that, are, that have been paid on those earnings offshore, but also get a deduction for the amount and don't have to recognize the full amount of, of income that results. On the foreign-derived intangible income, this allows a deduction, again, only for C-corporations, for sales and revenue from outside the U.S., for, again, that, for income that's not attributable to tangible depreciable assets. So what ends up happening is a, a calculation is done for any income in excess of a certain return on depreciable assets, and then a deduction is allowed against that, uh, that income for U.S. tax purposes to get a lower effective tax rate uh, in the U.S. for C corporations. Earlier, it was discussed that the alternative minimum tax was repealed for corporations. However, in its place is a new alternative minimum tax, which is called the Base Erosion Anti-Abuse Tax, or BEAT, provision. And what this does is it imposes a new AMT on large corporations again, only C corporations, who have average revenue over the last three years of $500 million or more and who are making deductible payments to foreign related parties when those payments equal at least 3% of the total expenses on the tax return. In that case, there's a new alternative minimum tax that's a, imposed at 10% 
after adding back those related party payments. So as I mentioned, in order to move into this new regime, there's an effect that's going to take place with 2017 tax returns that talks about um, the deemed repatriation of foreign earnings. So as discussed, there was a system of deferral other than subpart F rules that were previously in place, but because those earnings have not yet been subject to U.S. tax, they are now in order to provide the exemption for C corporations in future years. And again, even though that exemption is only available to C-corporations, all taxpayers have to pay the transition tax if they own at least 10% in a foreign corporation. So what this tax does is it's a one-time tax that's imposed on the accumulated earnings as of the end of 2017, looking at the greater of two, uh, the earnings at the, the greater of the earnings at two different measurement dates. And that income is taxed at either an effective rate of 15.5% or 8%, depending on what the assets that are being held by the foreign corporations are, whether it's in liquid assets or illiquid assets. There is an election for the tax to be paid over eight years with those payments being backloaded to the, the uh, last three years. And S corporation shareholders can elect to defer the payment of the tax to future years until that there's a time when there's a triggering event which would otherwise uh, result in them having to then start paying the tax. But this, the, this deferral of the treatment is only available to S corporation shareholders, not to LLC members or, or other uh, pass-through entities. So in terms of figuring out what the, the income effect and tax effect is of the deemed repatriation, there's really kind of a seven-step process that needs to be done to figure out the toll tax. And again, the first installment, which is 8% of the total liability, is going to be due on April 16th of this year. So regardless of whether a tax return is extended or not, that first payment is due at the, the tax return due date uh, without regard to extensions. So the first step is to identify uh, the foreign corporations that this is going to be subject to and then also what their earnings are uh, that are going to be subject to this tax. Then uh, figuring out what the any deficits that may have. So if you have some foreign subsidiaries with positive accumulated earnings and some with negative accumulated earnings, you're allowed to net the two together to, to, to arrive at an aggregate total amount, uh, and then you would need to look at your total aggregate cash and cash equivalents balances, which would include accounts receivable, and compare this to your total earnings. The lesser of those amounts is going to be subject, again, to the effective rate of 15.5%. And then if there are any earnings that are left that still have not yet been subject to tax, then those are going to be subject to tax at the 8% effective rate. For C corporations, you're able to use foreign tax credits to offset the, the tax burden on this. So to the extent that foreign taxes have been paid by those underlying foreign, and foreign corporations in prior years, you're able to use those taxes as a credit to offset. However, because the, the income is not being subject to tax at full U.S. tax rates, there's a pro rata reduction in the amount of credits that are available. And then finally, uh, an election can be made to use net operating loss carry forwards to offset the amount. So that election is, is again, due with the 2017 tax return for a taxpayer to determine whether or not it's going to use that NOL carry forward to offset the income inclusion. And so with that, we'll come to our second polling question. So with the new law, what is the likelihood that your company will repatriate, or you as a shareholder, will repatriate foreign earnings that have been previously deferred from U.S. tax? Is it A, more likely now, B, same as before, or C, less likely now? And I'll give you a couple of minutes to, or a minute to answer the question. All right, and it seems that the the change in laws has not 
move the needle a whole lot on people's uh, ability or, or thought process on whether they're going to repatriate their foreign earnings. And so with that, uh, and, and obviously with any type of tax change, there's always uh, planning to think through and uh, opportunities for review of current structure and current policies and procedures. So obviously, again, the, the most important one is determining what the tax is going to be on the deemed repatriation, because again, that will be included in 2017 tax returns, and for calendar year taxpayers, that that initial payment is going to be due on April 16th. Uh, the second is to review what the impact of the new provisions are. So in terms of uh, what income is being earned offshore, whether that income is taxed at a, a very low effective tax rate, and whether now that's going to be required to be included in U.S. taxable income uh, through the, the guilty provisions, uh, whether there are high amounts of related party payments offshore uh, that the beat uh, tax may apply. And then finally, you know, just over, an overall review of your global tax structure is warranted given the broad sweeping changes that are being enacted. I mean, the, the international changes as part of this bill are the biggest changes that have happened on the international tax landscape since 1962. And a lot of planning and, and work that has gone into place is really based off of those rules, which, you know, now are you know, over 50 years old, and, and this does kind of warrant a kind of a fresh look at everything to see do current structures still make sense, or is it something where uh, maybe a little bit going back to the drawing board is warranted. And with that, we'll move on to Andy and talk about the accounting for income tax. Thanks, Roy. Uh, yeah, so we're going to switch gears a little bit here um, and, and talk about financial statements and not the actual tax compliance. Uh, the important thing to note here, and Jennifer touched on it earlier, was that uh, this bill that was passed, uh, they got it through Congress in, in an amazing amount of time and got it to the president's desk. And when the president signed the bill, it's considered enacted. And under... Uh, ASC 740, that means that all the effects of the bill have to be accounted for in the period of enactment. So the 2017 financial statements uh, for calendar year companies and uh, the quarters uh, for companies that are fiscal. Um, and significantly, this applies to deferred taxes when they're being remeasured. And so um, companies are going to have to go through and do that. Uh, an important note here is that even if the tax effects uh, for things like unrealized gains have been included in other comprehensive income, meaning as part of equity, uh, the change here and the decrease is required to be shown in the, on the P&L through tax expense. Um, this issue could be significant for some companies and uh, the FASB is actually looking at that and discussing it next week uh, to see if there's guidance that they'll provide. Um, the tax reform is going to have a major impact, and Roy touched on the international accounting, and it's going to require significant analysis in order to include that in the financial statements. Now, some companies, uh, specifically uh, SEC filers, public companies, uh, their financial statements are due quickly. And so uh, the, the SEC came out, and they provided some guidance. Uh, we won't get into a lot of the detail. We have a detailed uh, ASC 740 presentation tomorrow uh, that we'll get into it. But uh, they're allowing companies to make provisional adjustments, uh, basically estimates, and then disclose what they need to do to get those estimates finalized. The other thing to consider is valuation allowances. Um, they're going to get uh, input, uh, and those inputs, as far as uh, sources of income, are going to be different. Uh, so everybody with a valuation allowance, that assessment will need to be made. Um, as far as the major change, um, Jennifer brought it up, the corporate rate change is the biggest. Uh, companies will have to remeasure, and so um, that's going to be uh, 
at a new 21% rate for timing differences that reverse after uh, 2017 year. For fiscal companies, that will be a bit more challenging. That's because, as Jennifer alluded to, there's a day's weighted average that will be needed. And so timing differences that are reversing during the year will actually end up reversing at a blended rate. And those in the future uh, will be at the 21% rate. So I think at this point, um, the action step there is to really take a look at the timing differences and map those out. Uh, deferred taxes are to be measured at an enacted rate uh, when they're expected to apply. And so uh, those are being measured at the new rate. Um, again, I mentioned that they're going to have to be at a uh, blended rate for some of them in the current period. And then international, um, as mentioned earlier, there's, a, there's some nuances to that that you may be uh, having to deal with. Now, AMT was repealed, uh, but of course we have to account for the, re the repeal and how those uh, credits are going to be used. And so for tax years in 1819 or 20, uh, the AMT credit can actually be utilized to offset regular tax. And then in addition, half of the credit remaining can get refunded, which will leave some credit. Um, you do that for the next three years. And then any remaining AMT credit carry forwards are going to be fully refundable in 2021. So um, taxpayers with that situation will have to figure out how to account for those as far as whether they're receivable um, or whether they're, um, they're deferred into the future. Uh, any, any valuation allowances that currently exist on those should be removed since uh, the law change made it fully refundable. Um, I mentioned you're going to have to classify them as current and non-current. And there is some discussion right now that um, since they're refundable, you can argue that they're all receivables and, and perhaps current and non-current. Um, we think it's also proper that they're uh, deferred since uh, they match up better with future receivables when recorded. And uh, that will be a company assessment that needs to be made. I uh, mentioned earlier, and I, I just wanted to reiterate, uh, and, and I underlined here that net operating losses are going to have some different treatment and will have to be shown differently in the financial statements. Um, problemat you know, a problem for the fiscal year companies is that uh, current year NOLs for uh, periods ending in 18, those are going to have a carry forward and no carry back. Um, but the 80% limitation actually starts on uh, NOLs that are created in tax years beginning after the end of the year. So that will be an area we need to keep an eye on. And of course, uh, deferred taxes for the NOLs are going to be measured at um, the effective rate when they expect to be utilized. Uh, that can impact your provision. Uh, and again, valuation allowances, uh, the, the evaluation there will need to take into consideration these changes. Uh, Roy went into some detail on the international provisions. Uh, what I'll just say here is that uh, uh, amounts deferred that were significant may be coming down uh, because of the tolling charge and the inclusion in income. And so uh, where companies had an indefinite reinvestment uh, assertion, that needs to be revisited um, in light of the new laws. And so um, that evaluation will have to take place. Um, the repatriation that Roy mentioned, um, the accounting for that will depend on whether the company uh, elects to um, make the payment at once, um, defer the payment, and so that will need to be allocated between periods. Um, and there's also, uh, as Roy mentioned, this uh, new base erosion and uh, anti-abuse tax that needs to be considered. and. If appropriate, if the company anticipates being in under that regime, uh, the company should consider whether or not their deferred taxes should be measured at a rate different uh, than the 21%. So um, another complication introduced uh, when you have two different tax regimes that you could fall under. Uh, 
along with all this, uh, there'll, there'll definitely be some changes in your financial statement disclosures. Uh, the alert or the uh, guidance that was provided by the SEC suggested that when companies are going to make provisional uh, adjustments to their financial statements and those amounts being estimates, um, those amounts will actually be disclosed and then all of the details here uh, are required to be included so that readers can understand uh, when the actual impacts will be recorded. Uh, so, so significant expansion and something to be aware of as you uh, get into the actual disclosures in the financial statements. So another polling question for you here. Uh, read this one carefully. At what rate do we expect most calendar year 2017 U.S. corporate filers to use in calculating current U.S. federal income taxes due? All right, we'll take a look. And <laughs> it is in the language. Um, the correct answer is 34, 35% because you're calculating uh, the current U.S. federal income tax. 21% would have been the correct answer on the deferred taxes because uh, they would be reversing at the future rate. And blended rate can be the right answer uh, if you weren't a calendar year corporation, if you were a fiscal year corporation, you may be required to use a blended rate. That's the day's weighted average. So definitely uh, changes for people. And uh, just a couple of key takeaways here. Mm -hmm. Consider all the companies that, uh, or the resources that you're going to need. There'll be significant more work to do to get your financial statements out. Um, Documentation is going to be key whether you're under internal control testing or not as a financial reporting company. And uh, finally, financial statement disclosures uh, are going to change. So all those changes need to be considered and uh, significant more work to do. So I'm going to turn this over to Gunnar. He's going to take you through some of the uh, elements of the pass-throughs. Thanks, Andy. And uh this part we'll talk a little bit about the pass through the, the the new special deduction that I'm sure many people are familiar with this 20% deduction that they've granted us and also talk a little bit about entity choice considerations and we'll also have a, a more detailed um, presentation on the 18th that'll kind of walk through entity choice considerations in light of this uh, fantastic 21% uh, corporate tax rate that Congress has given us so we're going to kick off this session with another polling question and the question here, it's just a true or false. Does the new tax regime favor C corporations? And I'll add over pass-through entities such as partnerships or S corporations. So I'll give you just a few moments to, to think about that and then we'll take a look at the answers. Let's see where we're coming at. 75% say that uh, the new regime favors C corporations, and I would I would definitely agree that they have become more favored um, than they were before. And I hope with the next couple of slides that we can kind of think about just how much more favored um, these C corporations have become, and in what cases it might make sense to become a C corporation if you're not already in that environment. And I, and I want to kind of at least plant a seed that this is a fairly nuanced analysis that needs to take place. So should all entities become C corporations? That's a question we're getting a lot of, and my default answer to that is, well, oftentimes when you run the math, the pass-through entities um, will still end up being better than a C corporation in many cases. And that's even when you account for the fact that there's a C corporation rate at 21% as compared to a 37% um, individual rate that could be paid on the, on the pass-through entity income and incorporating the fact that the C corporations can deduct 
their state income taxes without the limitations that are now going to apl be applied to individuals. Even, even when you have those things in place, oftentimes a pass-through entity will end up making sense, and we'll kind of walk, walk through why that is here in a minute. But these changes have certainly made this analysis a lot more interesting and presented a number of factual scenarios in which a C corporation will make sense. And so what are kind of some of the factors that you'd be looking for in your business that, that might, you might want to slow down and say, really, geez, should we really think about becoming a C corporation? There might be something here for us. And so one of those things is if your business cannot qualify for this special 20% deduction under section 199a which we'll talk about in a minute but this is the special 20 percent deduction on your income for pass-through entities if you cannot qualify for that that creates a gigantic spread right in this 21 percent corporate rate versus potentially at the top end of the individual wage 37 percent whereas if i can qualify for that 20 percent deduction at least at the top end of the individual rates that effective rate becomes 29.6 percent a much smaller spread between that number and 21%, um, often so small that it will become difficult for the C corporation to trump the pass-throughs in that environment once you factor in the second level of tax. Another situation where a C corporation would look very attractive is if I can eliminate the second level of tax. For instance, if I can get a step up of basis on the death of a significant shareholder, or I can apply some sort of exclusionary rule such as Section 1202 to the gain that I might recognize on, a C -corp on the sale of C corporation stock, the C corporation in that case would look very attractive. A third factor will be how long can I defer the second level of tax in a C corporation? That is, how long can I defer either paying a dividend from the C corporation or selling the C corporation stock a transaction in which I have to recognize gain, if I can do that for a significantly long period, that will obviously reduce the present value of that second level of tax, potentially making the C corporation um, a, a favored investment vehicle. And the final one is, as Roy touched on a number of things in the international space that only apply to C corporations. For instance, the, the dividends received deductions that's kind of moving us onto this territorial scheme, that's only a C corporation benefit. Pass-through entities do not get that. So if you have significant international operations, that might also be another case where you might want to look at moving some things to a C corporation if it can be done in a tax efficient manner. So let's take a look, and we will not go through all these numbers, but I, I, I think a numerical example is important in this choice of entity context, just so we can kind of start to get a flavor of this analysis. And again, on the 18th, we'll walk through this in, in some more detail. but. We're not going to go through all these, these numbers, but what we've posited here is kind of three scenarios. On the left, there's a C corporation. In the middle, there's a pass-through entity, i.e. a partnership or an S corporation that can take advantage of this new 20% deduction under Section 199A. Then on the far right, we have a pass-through entity that cannot take advantage of that 20% deduction. I just want to focus this in here. And this is a simplified fact pattern. I won't, I won't walk through it, but I want us to focus in on the, the gray box in the middle. And what that gray box is indicating is the after-tax return to these entities before any distribution is made to the, to the owners, i.e. before a second level of tax is incurred. And you can see at that point in time, just on one year's earnings, that the C corporation's after-tax return trumps both the after-tax returns for the pass-through entities because of, one, the ability to deduct state income taxes without limitation, and two, the 21% rate versus the higher tax rates that are being paid on the pass-through entity income. But then let's take a look at that lower grade out box down at the bottom. This posits a situation where the C corporation then goes and distributes in that same year all its income as a dividend to its owners. And you can see that once you take a look at the federal and state taxes that's gonna be applied to that dividend, the C corporation's after-tax rate of return is about 5%. That's being trumped in both in this situation, on these facts, by both scenarios in the pass-through regimes, where we've got you know 6.34% after-tax return and 5.6% after-tax return on those two pass-through entities. And so you can see what this indicates to us is that if I can't do something, generally speaking, kind of outside that international context, if I can't do something to either eliminate that second level of tax or defer it, oftentimes a pass-through entity will still trump the C corporations. And the moral of this story, that the message I want to get across is 
you need to model this stuff out. No one should be making a decision to be a C corporation just because of the 21% tax rate. You kind of got to walk through this and say, can I defer this or eliminate this second level of tax such that the double tax is not punitive to me? And so how much deferral might you need? And this just kind of, this slide just kind of illustrates the power of the second level of tax and why it's still a very powerful thing. And so in this, the green bar at the top, what we've tried to do here is we said, how many years would it take under, again, very simplified facts here, but how many years would it take in which we were compounding our returns at that higher C corporation after tax rate of return so that when we paid the second level of tax, I would equal the rate of return that I would get in a pass-through entity that could not qualify for the special 199A deduction. Well, it takes about 11 and a half years to make that, those numbers work. Probably more startling calculation, at least on the, again, on very simplified facts here, is that it take about 35 years, if we look down to that second green bar, it take about 35 years for you to overcome the second level of tax on a C corporation, and under very stylized facts here, you could change from, but years to overcome the second level of tax as compared to a pass-through entity that can take it in its entirety of the 20% 199A deduction. So that gives you kind of a flavor for the, the, the importance of modeling this and the importance of deferral or eliminating the second level of tax still, even in light of the 21% corporate tax rate. So obviously the, the 199A provision is very, is very important to this. And what is, what is that kind of, what are the requirements for qualifying under the section 199, 199A deduction to get that 20% deduction in the pass-through um, the pass through realm. The first thing you gotta do is have a, have a qualified business. And what is a qualified business? Well, it's a trader business, so it's something that's not investment um, type of activity, and it's not one of these specified services. And on the 18th, we'll kind of walk through this in more detail about what a specified service is. Um, but generally, services activities are limited in the benefits they can obtain from Section 199A. Then you've got to have qualified business income being produced by this qualified business. And what is that? Well, it's generally business income that's, uh, that, that, that's earned by, the, by this business, but it's got to be effectively connected to the United States. And it can't be investment type of income, such as dividends, capital gains, etc. That income is put through two limitations, the first being um, this W-2 and property limitation. So the general rule is my deduction equals 20% of my qualified business income, but then I got to compare it to these limitations. And I take the greater, these limitation is the greater of 50% of my W-2 W two wages attributable to that business or 25% of the W-2 wages um, attributable, to that, attributable to that business plus 2.5% of qualified property attributable to that business, which is generally tangible, depreciable property. Then my last limitation um, is a limitation based on 20% of the taxable income of the taxpayer. And so you have to work your way all through that 199A deduction and uh, to figure out if you're going to qualify for this 20% benefits. I'm going to skip over this because we're running out of time. 461L, this is a new loss disallowance rule. We will cover this in more depth if you're interested in the pass-through regimes on that webinar in the 18th. And so, Jennifer, I'll pass it back to you for wrapping us up. All right, great. Thanks, Gunnar. And thanks to Scott, Roy, Andy, and, and Gunnar. Uh, we've certainly covered a lot in this past 60 minutes. Um, so we'll just briefly recap some next steps that you may want to consider. Uh, the first three items on this list, as we've discussed, all have impact uh, for 2017, and so action may be needed in the very short term. Uh, first, uh, obviously, companies will need to determine how the new rules impact their financial reporting and their 2017 provisions. And companies uh, that will be subject to the repatriation provision will need to qu quickly uh, compute that for an EMP if they haven't already done so. Uh, companies should not miss the opportunity to uh, create that permanent tax savings by revisiting their accounting methods and, and making an accounting method change to either accelerate deductions or defer income uh, on 2017 return. Uh, they need to make the, to be able to benefit from that. They'll need to do that before that 21% corporate rate or if they're eligible for that pass-through deduction that Gunnar just talked through. And then, obviously, for uh, the uh, changes for fringe benefits, those changes are effective for amounts paid or incurred after January 1st, 2018, and so companies will want to revisit those their uh, plans. And also, broadly, uh, you know, a company can benefit from modeling the various tax law changes to see how the changes affect 
their current tax positions. And with that, I'll turn it over to Emily to close us out. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you to the rest of our presenters for a great presentation today. We invite you to join us for our upcoming tax reform webcast. You can register for these webcasts and learn more about tax reform in the links in the slide deck and handouts widget to the right of your slide view. Since we did not have time to answer live attendee questions today, we will do our best to follow up with you after the webcast, or you may reach out directly to one of our presenters. As a reminder, if you attended today's presentation in a group and would like to receive CPE credit, you must complete the group attendance sheet found in the slide deck and handouts icon again to the right of your slide view. If you participated as an individual and met all certification requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE progress window to the right of the slide view. I'll keep the console open for a few minutes to give you time to download this now. A copy of your CPE certificate will be emailed within two weeks should you have any difficulty downloading it now. And here is a link to an online survey where you can provide feedback for today's presentation. Please take a moment to complete this survey as your feedback is very important to us. Thank you for joining us and we hope you'll join us again next time.